from Dante's Inferno, Canto One. Midway through our life's journey, I came round within a dark wood. I had gone astray from the straight pathway to that twisted ground. Oh, what it was is a hard thing to say, so overgrown with rank things, savage, raw. The thought renews the fear in me today, barely less bitter than death. But to draw in words the good that I found there as well, I will relate those other things I saw. How I got into it I still can't tell. So full of sleep I was the moment where I had begun to wander off and fell from the true path. But once I had drawn near the foot of a hill, at the outer bound of that ravine which spiked my heart with fear, I looked up and there saw its shoulders gowned in the first light of that sun, whose sweet ray leads every step aright on every ground. Then some of the fear began to melt away, which my heart's curdled lake had had to bear all through the worry of the night till day, and like a half-drowned man still gasping air who escapes riptides and comes safe ashore, might turn back on the lethal waves and stare, so did my soul, still fugitive, once more turn back and slowly look that passage over which none had ever left alive before. I paused a bit to let my flesh recover, then started back up the lone barren slope, my firm foot always lower than the other. Then, just where the slope started to turn up, a spot-pelt leopard sprang and stared me down. Lissom and quite sleek, it came at a lope wherever I tried to turn and gave no ground in blocking every way that I could try and forced me over and over to turn round. The time was early morning. In the sky the sun was mounting with those stars above that rode with it when all that panoply of lovely things was set by God's own love into first motion. The fine hour of grace and gentle season were enough to move my hope despite the beast that blocked my pace with festive pelt. But even greater fear struck when a lion sprang before my face. He seemed prepared to pounce upon me there, with head primed high, his roar so ravenous it seemed to terrify the very air. And then a she-wolf, whose starved scrawniness seemed glutted with all cravings, her physique has run so many down to wretchedness. The very sight of her set on my weak spirit such weight of fear that, once again, I lost all hope of making it to the peak." And as a miser eager in his gain, when fortune's wheel has turned him destitute, has his thoughts turned into misery and pain, so was I before that beast, that feral brute that knew no peace, came at me, bit by bit driving me down to where the sun goes mute. While I went plunging even lower yet, my eyes were offered a new being, one as if vast silence enervated it. Seeing it in that friendless hinterland, I cried out, O miserere on me, whatever you are, shade or bodied man. He spoke, Not man, though man I used to be. My parents are Mantuans. On either side, their lineage goes back to Lombardy. Born some time before Julius Caesar died, I lived under August Octavian in Rome, in that age of false gods that lied. I was a poet, him the righteous son of old Anchises, refugee from Troy after the burning of proud Ilion. But why revisit all these sorrows? Why don't you ascend that blissful mount instead, the origin and cause of every joy? Are you that Virgil, then, the fountainhead that pours such fluent streams of eloquence? With shame upon my humbled brow I said, honor and light of poets. Let my immense love and long study of your poetry avail me in my black hour. My work begins with you, my author and authority. It is from you alone I took the whole heroic style for which they honor me. You see the beast that bars me from my goal, time-gloried sage. Please, help me to outface this thing that makes my veins quake and run cold. 
he answered, seeing tears upon my face. You'll need another way to travel by if you plan to escape this savage place. That fleering beast that gives you cause to cry will not let anybody get past her. She hunts and harries them and they will die. So vicious and depraved her character that nothing sates her appetite of greed and when she feeds she just gets hungrier. She's bred with many creatures and she'll breed with many more till she's tracked down and dealt her death of pain by the Greyhound. He will feed and feed himself on no man's land or pelf but wisdom, justice, love and bravery, and his race of birth shall run from wealth to wealth. He shall redeem that fall in Italy which Euryalus, Turnus, made Camille and Nisus bled to death for. Doggedly he'll hunt that bitch through Bergen town until he's dragged her back to hell from which she was loosed by primeval envy for the kill. So, for your sake, I think the two of us should go together. Follow me and I will lead you out of here and on across eternal places, where you'll hear the high shriekings of deep despair and come to see the ancient spirits under torture cry at the second death of souls. Then you shall be witness to those who are hopeful in the fire of welcome to the blessed ultimately, to which you will be led, should you desire, by a soul worthier than mine. I shall leave you with her once I can go no higher. The king of time, who rules there above all, because I lived against his law, will see none come through me into his capital. His rule is everywhere, but there reigns he. There is his city, throne, and retinue. Lucky who live there by his majesty. I said, in the name of him you never knew in life, I pray you, poet, get me well out of this harm and worse. Take me with you and lead me to that place of which you tell, so I may look upon St. Peter's gate. So let me see the multitudes of hell. He started moving, and I followed straight. <laughs>